about our environment and sustainability. And that's why he's here tonight. Please welcome Dave Kamites. How's everyone doing? Good. And it is really cool to be back here. I'm totally psyched to be here. Are you psyched to be here? Yeah. I got to give a shout out to Karen Ivy who uh, sent me a Facebook thing and said, "You got to come." And I was like, "Oh yeah, I got to, I got to get over there." So thank you. Um, it is so cool to be here. Uh, so let me just get this right. You guys are, are basically the future leaders of North Carolina, right? Yeah. Not so much as, as GSW, it's more GSE, right? Yeah. I, just, you know, I like to know who I'm talking to. So basically I'm not wasting my time here, giving you a little bit of information, and trying to change the world. You like the music at the beginning? Yes. Yeah. It really all boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We're all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied together into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Brother Martin Luther King Jr. Everything that we do in life affects everyone else. What I do invariably affects someone in Australia. What they do affects me. And throughout life, we have choices, right? We have choices every day. If you study for that test, change your underwear, go over to a party and talk to that super groovy hot chick or guy or whatever you call it. Cute kids. <laughs> and every time you make a choice, right, there are consequences. You don't study for the test, you fail. You don't change your underwear, you know what happens there. And if you go over and talk to that super groovy guy or girl, you're probably going to get shot down because you're failing out of school and you smell pretty bad, right? <laughs> Choices and consequences. Everything in life is choices and consequences. Uh, at the beginning of the year 2008, actually 2007, I'm sorry, just before the year 2008, I was sitting with a friend and we were talking about throwing something away. Okay? Who here has thrown something away? Who here has thrown something away today? We all do, it's part of our lives. Where is away? Trash can. Dump, trash can, whatever. Do you actually know where it goes? No, no, I'm talking about in your mind, you can actually see the place that it goes to. The answer is, with maybe a couple of exceptions, most of us do not. And I didn't realize at the time, as I was thinking like away, the only thing away is it's not here, it's there, but I don't know if it's there, and I don't know if it's getting there. I don't really know what's happening there, and more importantly, I don't know how much I'm sending there. I'm really making a choice that I don't understand the consequences of that choice. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just part of a system that seems to move forward and go forward and do its thing, and I have no idea. So I decided that for a year, I would stop throwing everything away. I would not throw any trash away, and I would not recycle anything either, and instead keep it in the basement of my house. Now let's see a show of hands. Who thinks that's nuts? Okay, put your hands down. Who among you were very polite and think that's nuts, but didn't want to put your hands up when I asked you if you thought that was nuts? So pretty much everybody thinks that's nuts, right? It's not really a normal thing. I, at the beginning of the year, I was married to a very lovely lady, and I had two young children, two daughters, and I am very happy to say I'm still married to that very lovely lady, and I still have those very two young daughters. And I decided that because I wasn't being responsible, because I wasn't recognizing what my impact was, I would just start putting it down there and See what happened. Now, I didn't think this through completely. <laughs> this is not something that someone really does after a lot of calculation. This is more of a spur kind of thing. And I realized that as stuff went down there, I would look at things because I was now confronted with them before they were just going away. And I would go, well, wait a minute. I can do something different about that. And I can do something different about that. And I don't even need to use that. And I don't even know what that is. And I would go down and every once in a while play with the garbage and the recycling. Yes, I'm a little strange. And da 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 And at the end of the year, this is what I was left with. Okay? It looks like a lot of trash, right? It's actually not. That box, that box, and that box is all of my trash, everything that would normally go to a landfill for a year. 28 and a half pounds. The average American is 1,600 pounds. Everything else here is recycling. All of it got recycled, some of it even got turned into an art project. And the trash, by the way, is in Connecticut in the Museum of Trash where it's on permanent display. My life is a little strange, I'll admit it. But it's a good thing because it teaches people. But the point is, is I never would have gotten down to 28 and a half pounds if I hadn't been, had to confront what I was doing. 
I wasn't confronted with the consequences of my actions. Because I gained the intelligence of what I was doing, I could make smarter decisions about it, and I could cut that way down. Now, I'm just one person. What about if everybody in America did this? Well, then you wouldn't have things like Puente Hills Landfill, where my trash goes to, where I actually did go to see where my trash went, which gets 13,000 tons of trash every day. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? <laughs> when you're there and the trucks just keep coming, you're like, stop, stop, stop. And they do stop. They stop at 13,000 because that's their quota for the day. Then the next day, they take 13,000 tons more. It's insane. And all of this has to do with consumption. So I realized that by learning, I could change what I was doing and make a big, big difference. The name of the seminar comes off of that, or this seminar, I should say, comes off of that. The name of the seminar is Chasing Sustainability. Chasing, we all know, running after something, trying to catch something, something like that. Sustainability, anybody know what it means? Exactly. If you get 10 people who are experts in sustainability, and I'm not one of them, in a room, and you put them together and you say, what's sustainability? You get 15 different answers. Nobody can really peg it down, okay? It's, it's kind of all over the place. This is how I like to talk about it. In our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations of the great law of the Iroquois Confederacy. See, what these folks realize is, is the choices I make today, are not just about me, they're about seven generations down from now. I've got to think what's happening seven generations from now, every choice I make. That's what sustainability is, and that's what I'm hoping to start to get you all thinking about so that when you grow up to take over the world, which you will, right? Right? You gotta make, I gotta know you're awake, right? Come on. Go! Yeah. Oh, that's what I want! Okay. You're gonna change things, okay? Global warming. You ever hear of this? Okay. This is why I'm not gonna talk about it. Well, <laughs> except for the next two minutes in which we're gonna talk about it a little bit and explain why I went too fast, but anyway. I don't need to talk about global warming. Let me go back to that. It's not that it's not important. It's not that it's one of the biggest things that will affect your lives. It's because I don't have to. First of all, you ever see that video of like the big icebergs falling down in the water? Yeah. Okay. Does it freak you out? Yeah. Freaks me out. I've got two kids and I look at it and I'm like, I don't know, what do you glue that? You put a nail in that? How do you hold that back up? I don't know what to do about that. I can't, I can't do anything. The polar bear hanging out on the thing. I don't know what to do with polar bears. <laughs> I, I, I've never even actually seen a real polar bear. I don't know what to do. And I look at that and I go, I know I'm causing that. But I can't, I can't, it just freaks me out. And I want to go and curl up in a corner and read a book and suck my thumb and just pretend it's not happening. But that's not good, is it? Because it is happening. We've got problems with it. Here's the reason. And hopefully I will show you this the rest of tonight. I don't need to talk about global warming. Why? What's your deal? Are you religious? Well, then all I have to do is convince you that God made the world, you're destroying the world, you're a sinner, and you're going to hell. <laughs> that's pretty simple, right? You've not changed. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be going, we'll be splitting up into religions, and I'll hit all of you in a second. But that's pretty simple, right? So all I got to do is there. Are you an anti-government radical? Fantastic. Stop using government electricity and uh, gas and all those things. Go dig a hole in the side of the mountain, get yourself a shotgun and a couple of brewskis, and hang out and wait for the government to come, right? Stop <laughs> using power. Simple, right? Okay? National security? Okay. Don't drive your car. Why are you using foreign oil if you're worrying about it? Why are you sending your money overseas? Come on. Think about it, Okay? Societal collapse, well, you can hang out with the anti-government radical and you guys can like maybe connect in the middle and one can guard the, you know, same kind of thing. If you are a hippie, I don't really need to tell you, look at me. <clears throat> Got a couple hippies in the audience? Yeah. yeah. That's what I like to hear. And if you want me to leave you alone, I can, but I'm kind of enjoying myself. Are you enjoying this? <laughs> so basically, I can hit you on 10 different levels and I never have to talk again about global warming. It's pretty simple. And it'll never be completely, absolutely, until it's over, confirmed, because it's too big. So just forget about global warming. Just stop it anyway. We're going to start really, really big today. Energy, where are we and where are we going? How much energy does the planet use? <laughs> it's exactly what I thought, but I found out it's a little more exact than that. There is a guy named Dr. Nathan Lewis, who's like super, super smart, who in Caltech in 1998, California Technical Institute, really, really smart people, got together and said, you know, we're talking about global warming and all these numbers and all this, this and that and the other, and we need a number. We need like something we can like graph or something that smart people do with it. And he said, we've got to get together and, 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 and figure this out. So he got this picture, which unfortunately it's a, little, it's a little bright in here, but this is the world at night. And you can see like all the big populated areas are all, they're all lit up. Obviously this is like seven pictures because the planet's never like that. But 
And then where it's, it took me a bit, because I was like, how do they take it at night? Um, <laughs> like I said, Nathan Lewis, really smart. Um, but so these areas, which are not so heavily populated and quote unquote third world, which I would disagree with, but that's another story, another talk, um, are not all lit up. But that's a lot of power. So, so guys, look at the map. Let's do some calculations. Get your slide rules and your abacuses, and you get the computer and this and that. And the other way, and crunch some numbers. And they spent a bunch of time, and they got a lot of pizza, and drank a lot of Coke, and did whatever they do, and whatever. And they came up with this number, 12.8 terawatts. Now, by the way, they took heat, and they took electricity, they took everything, and they went, they put it in one unit so we could talk about something, okay? 12.8 terawatts. We all know what a terawatt is, right? No? No one knows what a terawatt? I thought you guys were like the leaders of tomorrow. Wow. All right, well, I heard Dr. Nathan Lewis speaking to a bunch of scientists, and all the guys around me were like, ooh, terawatts, that's sick. And I was like, sorry, I, you've lost me. <laughs> I get the watt part, the terra doesn't make sense. And he said, I got something for you, it's okay. And I've sort of co-opted to explain it to you. This is just to give you a general idea, okay? One watt is essentially what an old school laptop uses. Picture of my dog on it, maybe a little more, but you know, generally just think a laptop, think one watt, okay? You all with me? Power of 10, we're at one kilowatt, okay? Hello, hello kitty toaster oven, 10, okay? One kilowatt or 1,000 watts. 1,000 laptops, Hello Kitty toaster oven. Okay, everybody with me? Go up by a power of 10, we're at one megawatt, jet engine, right? Okay, 1,000 kilowatts or 1,000 Hello Kitty toaster ovens. If you get on a plane and there are 1,000 Hello Kitty toaster ovens under there, don't get on the plane. <laughs> okay? There's plenty of power there, but it's just not, maybe some toast, but no, you're not gonna do it. it you, won't, you won't crash, that's a good thing, because you won't get up in the air. You know where I'm going with this. All right, power of 10, one gigawatt, nuclear power, right? Lots of power, power cities and stuff like that. 1,000 megawatts or 1,000 jet engines. One terawatt is 1,000 gigawatts or 1,000 nuclear power plants. So we're talking about 12.8 terawatts is 12,800 nuclear power plants. In 1998, there were 440 nuclear power plants in the world. Okay, today there are actually 439. So. Just to give you an idea, and again, I'm not pushing nuclear power, but we all look at that and we go, okay, you don't want to stick your fingers in the socket on the side of that because it's a lot of power. And if I was going to tell you how many solar panels it was, I'd be talking that number, speaking that number until next week, and you go, he's still there. <laughs> so it's just it's an idea to encapsulate it. 12,800 nuclear power plants in the world. So then they were going to, you know, they were like, hey, we did it. We got 12.8 terawatts, blah, blah, blah. And he said, wait, hang on, come on, come on. Come on. They said, well, that's only half the battle. I said, well, what do you mean? We did, we did it. And he said, yeah, but that's where we are. Got to figure out where we're going. Got to figure out 50 years. Why 50 years? Because 50 years is generally the amount of time it takes for a society to go from one energy source to the next, okay? Wood to steam, steam to coal, coal to oil, oil to who knows, okay? 50 years, because obviously they come out with the technology, early adopters, et cetera, et cetera. And they did some more calculations and they figured it out. And they figured that in 50 years, we're going to need 25 terawatts, or roughly two times the amount that we needed in 1998. Twice. Now, pretty much every study since then says that we are on a trajectory to go way past that. Okay? But because this is a lot, we're just going to stick with this. By the way, one thing I didn't mention, the first half of this talk, I'm going to try to severely depress you. <laughs> Okay, hopefully I'm on that road, but we're going to get a little, we're going to get down, but I promise you I will leave you feeling happy at the end, okay? So we'll, you, all, you all go with that? Okay, I'll, we're going to pick it back up at the end. But we got, we got to go down before we can come up, okay? To give you an idea how much that is, we'd have to build one nuclear power plant every other day for the next 34 years. Does anybody here know how to build a nuclear power plant? No. Gentlemen in the back, I want to talk to you afterwards, but... Maybe you can, you can work on this with me. Uh, I'm trying to paint the kitchen with my wife, and it takes us more than a day and a half to figure out what color it is. So I got to assume the nuclear power plants take more than two days to build, right? <laughs> so this is not going to work so well, OK? Now, usually at this point, people say to me, but Dave, why are you here talking to us? There are two countries in the world that use all the power. What countries are those? China. India. China and India, they're the bad ones, right? We hear about it all the time. They're using too much power, okay? What's happening in China and India, okay? If you count them, China and India have like a kajillion people, okay? They've got, I don't know what the number actually is, but it's pretty close to a kajillion. And all those people are starting to make a little bit of money. And they're starting to get sort of middle class and upper middle class. And they want to be like who? 
Exactly. So is China and India the problem, or are we the problem? Okay. Well, China and India are the problem, too, because they're using a lot of electricity. I'll give you that. But if they're modeling their lives after us, and they want two cars, and we, and five TVs, and a huge house with air conditioning, we're the problem, okay? Now, on a more concrete level, in 1998, and it's actually risen since then, we used 26% of the world's power, or a quarter of the world's power. 3% of the people used 26% of the world's power. We also put out 26% or 25% of the world's greenhouse gases. So it seems like maybe we're using a little more than we should. Does that, does that make sense? So my thought is, let's clean up our house and then talk to other people about theirs. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, that makes sense. That's what I was taught about when I was a kid. Clean up your room, and then you can tell me to clean up mine. That's what I tell my kids anyway. Um, bottom line is that amount of power is unachievable. It's unacceptable, and it's completely unsustainable. Can't keep going like this. It just doesn't work. We went from energy, right? We're going to pop down a little bit here, and we're going to go to the coming storm, OK? My grandfather rode a camel. My father rode a camel. I drive a Mercedes. My son drives a Land Rover. His son will drive a Land Rover, but his son will ride a camel. It's kind of funny, right? <laughs> well, not funny. But you realize it's a different kind of funny when you hear that Sheikh Rashid bin Said al Maktoum said this on the coming oil crisis in the Middle East in 1990. So the good Sheikh, who was basically in charge of bringing money into the country, said, folks, it's running out. We got to do something. That's why, do you know what's going on in uh, Dubai? Have you seen pictures of Dubai? They like build islands and they've got an in inside ski resort, <laughs> which not exactly environmentally friendly, but kind of cool in its own way, right? They're getting Disneyland, they're getting everything. It's becoming a mega economic center of the Middle East and of the world because he said, you know what? This stuff's going to run out and basically if we're like everybody else and just keep using it, we're going to end up eating sand. And I don't like sand, so we're going to do something else and start making money a different way. Okay? So he was smart enough to realize that the oil is finite. Not quite enough for me. I need a little more than that. I mean, the sheik seems like a good guy, and it's a funny quote, but I need a little more. Fossil fuels, okay? We're basically talking about petroleum, natural gas, and coal. Those are the big three. Okay? Petroleum is the one we're going to talk about today. What's, what's, what do we use petroleum for? Every, did someone say everything? Right there, everything. Good man. You jumped ahead of me a little bit, but I like that. Excuse me. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, petroleum, gasoline, we generally use that for what? Getting our butts from one way to another. Because why? We really like to get into a 5,000-pound vehicle to drive half a mile and get out of the 5,000-pound vehicle to go somewhere else. That makes a lot of sense, right? Just conceptually? No, not so much. So basically, when we're talking about fossil fuels, we're talking about the stuff that's in the ground because the dinosaurs and the plants, and by the way, again, just very mild science going on here, <laughs> died millions and trillions of years ago, and they fell, and dirt came on them, and water came on them, and pressure, and they turned into all this good stuff. And years ago, someone said, hey, we can burn this, and it's great, and it makes great energy. To give you an idea, in the United States, coal is about 49%. Remember, uh, what was it back in like... Uh, February or March, they had that, that big uh, cave-in in Virginia, was it? Remember that? Anybody here think that they were there for them? Like that they were a little responsible for that? I don't know about you, but when that happened, I thought, I, I don't like the fact that guys go underground to dig little rocks out so that I can watch TV. <laughs> I'm not comfortable with that. 49% coal. Uh, then we're at natural gas, 20%. By the way, we've got about, uh, they say we've got about 200 years left of coal in this country. We've got about 80 years left of natural gas. Nuclear, we're at 19%. Petroleum is 2%. And then we've got hydroelectric and renewable energy, which I clumped together into 9%. What we need to do to get sustainable is make this all the way there. Now, that's going to run out. That's going to run out. That's going to run out. That's got some serious problems with it. But those guys, if they're done correctly, could keep going forever. So I don't know about you, but that little part of the pie <laughs> seems to make a lot more sense than this part of the pie, doesn't it? Yeah? OK, cool. I just got, I got to make sure you're with me here. This is a thing from National Geographic, OK? This is a five-family house. And they went in, and these uh, guys went in, and they said they looked at everything in the house. They took everything in the house that uses petroleum in its making, mainly plastic, and they put it on the front lawn. Everything in their house, every single one of you is wearing petroleum. 
This may sound a little weird, but every single one of you just ate petroleum. And I'm not talking about the quality of the food here. Uh, because most fertilizers are petroleum-based unless it's completely organic. So we're all eating petroleum, OK? Seems a little weird and not so great, but it's the reality. So it's a major part of our life. Now, anybody here ever been in the, uh, in the hospital, unfortunately? Well, you're here, so fortunately, I guess. OK. You're right, you have an IV, right? OK. IVs are they're plastic, right? They got that little tube. And I mean, granted, the metal thing goes in there, but it's plastic. They used to have glass ones. That seems like it would hurt a lot, right? <laughs> not so much with the glass one. I'd rather have the plastic thing going in. Well, I don't know about you, but I can kind of do without the big yellow ball and the, and the little pool here. <laughs> I'd like to stick with important things that we use petroleum for and not waste it on this stuff and find new uses for this stuff. So we have to be smarter about how we use it, OK? To give you an idea of how oil is created, right? Let's just say that this is all of the oil in the planet, OK, this circle. We're talking conceptual here. Everybody with me? OK? 100 billion, trillion, quadrillion years ago, there was nothing in it. And then, like I said, the dinosaurs came and the plants came and blah, 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 blah. And all of that filled up, OK? Let's just say 150 million years ago it happened. Are we cool with that number? Yeah. Give or take a million years between friends, right? OK. So then. About 200 years ago, something called the Industrial Revolution happened. And all these guys said, hey, you know, we don't have to like hand make this stuff anymore. We can get these big machines and factories and we can like burn stuff out of the ground and start, you know, using it for that. And then we can have companies that mass produce cars and they can use this stuff and we can drive down the street and things like that. And we started using it, we started using it, and in 150 years, we've used half of it. Who said, <laughs> thank you. Because I say every time I do that. What's going to happen in what's going to happen in 150 years? What? Okay. Theoretically, it'll all be gone, but we'll actually never get to it. And at the rate we're using it, if we were to get to it, it would come a lot faster. But we are going to get to the point where we can't get any more out of the ground. Okay. So I'm here telling you it's half gone, right? But who am I? You're not going to believe me. Don't you want a little proof here? I do. I did. This guy, M.K. Hubbard. M.K. was a really smart guy who worked for Standard Oil. He needed a better barber. <laughs> it's the truth, right? I was going to get one of those for a while, but I just I opted not to. And my, wife, my wife's cool with that. So M.K., besides not taking great pictures, was a very smart guy who worked for Standard Oil, which was a big oil conglomerate. And it, I think it became Exxon or Chevron or something like that. Doesn't make a difference. Back in the 50s, he had this really cool thing called the slide rule. You guys seen slide rules? Right? Don't know how they work, but they're really cool. And he was figuring stuff out. And one day he had an aha moment. And he went up to the head of Standard Oil and went, and he knocked on the door. And he said, boss, I, I, I got a little, uh, I'm a little worried about something. And he said, Hubbard, what's up? You're always knocking on my door while I'm eating. He had a sandwich in his mouth. Uh, this is my part of the story, by the way, because I just like how it sounds. Uh, and Hubbard said, I think we're in trouble with the oil in the United States. And he said, what are you talking about? We're pumping it out of the ground. It's great. And he said, no, nah, if you look at the slide rule, he said, ah, slide rule. What are you talking about? He said, well, in 20 years, around 1970, between 70 and 75, we're going to hit something called Hubbard's Peak. I called it Hubbard's Peak because I found it, and I'm Hubbard, and I'm calling it that. So that's the way that goes. And his boss said, what are you what's Hubbard's Peak? And he said, well, here's the deal. This is 150 million, 100 trillion years ago, whatever, where there was no oil in the ground, right? OK? And this is where all the oil is going, OK? So the oil was created, and we started using it, created and started using it, created and started using it. We started pulling it out of the ground, pulling it out of the ground, pulling it out of the ground. And this is where 50% of it's gone. And he said, all right, so what? And he said, well, we're going to hit the 50% mark around 1972, I think. And he said, well, wait a minute. You said it's all 50%. You got all that. And he said, yeah, but the problem is we're going to continue to use it at an alarming rate, and it's going to pass the peak. And after we get past the peak, it's going to get harder and harder to get it out of the ground. And the president said, Hubbard, you're crazy. Do me a favor. We're moving you down to the basement. Don't bother me anymore. And they hung out for a while. And they waited 20 years. And then around the 1970s, you probably don't remember. Um, I remember, I don't know if any of the folks upstairs remember, there was something called the oil embargo in this country. And literally, overnight, the wells ran dry. It happened very, very quickly. And all the people started calling in and saying, our geologists are telling there's, there's oils in the ground, but we can't get it out. It's too hard. It's too deep. There's too much sediment. What's going on? And there was an oil embargo. And where I was, people would wait. If you had, if you had a, a, um, a license plate, 
If you had an even number on the end of your license plate, you could get gas on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Ima imagine this. Do you guys drive yet? Yeah. Okay, imagine not being able to get gasoline whenever you want. How crazy is that, right? It's always there. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, if you had an odd number, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I don't know what they did on Sunday, uh, if you had an even number, and people would wait for hours in line and literally push their cars because they didn't want to use gasoline, okay? So all the oil companies went and they went to places like Venezuela and Saudi Arabia and places like that, and they started importing it, and they started bringing more oil into the country, and they said, all right, we're cool, we're cool. And then the head of Shell, uh, Standard Oil said, you know what, we, uh, we should go back and talk to Dr. Hubbard, because he was kind of right, and <laughs> we should find out what's going on. So they went downstairs, and they said, look, we're really sorry. And he said, it's cool. Don't worry about it. I'm you know, going to get a new haircut or whatever. And they said, do you have any other like, pearls of wisdom? And he said, yeah. Uh, since we last talked, I got this fancy new thing called a calculator, and I've been doing all sorts of numbers on it. And I figured out that the United States just hit peak oil, and the world is going to hit peak oil in the year 2005. He said, maybe I'm off by 10 years. There's too many numbers to go on. But within 10 years, 2005, we're going to hit peak oil. And they all went, <laughs> get out. And he looked at them, and they went, all right, cool. <laughs> We've got a little time. We'll figure this out. Let's see what we can do. Why is this a problem? Well, out in California, we have this thing called uh, In-N-Out Burger, which is a burger stand, obviously. You know, you guys know in Do they have it here? No. OK. For those who said, yeah, you know, you know the milkshakes at In-N-Out Burger? Okay, the milkshakes in and out burger are insane. Why? Because they're essentially ice cream, right? <laughs> it's not a milkshake, it's ice cream, and it's kind of cruel of them. But if you're like me, you go and grab an in and out burger milkshake, and you slam that straw all the way, and you, and you can't get anything out of it. And your wife laughs at you because you do this all the time. But you want the milkshake, right? So, you guys have, is there, is there a place here that has these things? Cookout. What's it called? Cookout. Cookout? Yeah. All right, everybody, cookout after the talk, okay? So anyway, so what do you do? You're right on. So you slam that, that, that straw in there, and you want, you want to get at it, because it's all the way down. You can't, because it's that ice cream stuff. So what do you do? You throw it out? No, you don't throw it out. Come on, it's cookout, right? You pull it up to the top, and you start taking off the top, because it's good stuff. And as you get down, it's easier and easier and easier. Well, essentially, and I like to think this is how the oil companies figured it out, this is exactly how you get oil. You don't go for the hard stuff, you go for the easy stuff. And then it gets a little harder and harder and harder and harder and harder, and eventually, well, you're in some trouble and you're at peak oil. That's essentially what happens. It's nothing more than a big milkshake, okay? So, I clicked that too quickly. I'm gonna get the veggie cars in one minute. Um, I came in at six this morning after an overnight flight, and my head still so <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves for one sec. But maybe I haven't convinced you yet about peak oil, okay? Well, I could tell you about the Gawar oil field in Saudi Arabia, largest oil field in the world, that plug, pumps in 7 million gallons of seawater every day just to get the oil to the surface in order to get it out. I could tell you about all of the things that are going on. But the one thing that kind of kicks me is Yaron Vanderveer, who is the, or was the CEO of Shell, CEO is chief executive officer, his basic job is to run the company and let the stockholders know that everything's cool, right? You're going to keep making money. It's great. Okay? In 2002, he sent out a letter to the stockholders saying, we are five years away from peak oil. Now, why would he do that if it's not true? Or if he doesn't think it's true? There's no reason in the world. And then they started buying up solar panel companies. Now, oil, you put it in your car, you drive, you got to get it again. You put it in your car, you drive, you got to get it in. It's a drug. You need more of it. And you keep on buying it from them, and they make money. Solar panels, like I have on my house, you buy from them, you put them on your solar panel, and then you go, <laughs> I don't need to give you any more money. <laughs> so it doesn't make nearly as much money. So economically, why would they do this? That's the big kicker for me. So I started learning about this, and I was like, peak oil and oil and whatever. And by the way, one other thing. Let's say all my numbers are off. Do we all agree that the oil in the ground is finite? Yes. Other than 150 million years from now, but that's not really helping me much, is it? <laughs> so essentially, it's going to run out, right? And the question is, do we want to hit the wall at 5 miles an hour? Or do we want to hit it at 150 miles an hour? I, want to hit it. I don't want to hit it at all, but if we hit it, I want to tap it at 5, OK? So we've got to start thinking a little better. So I started reading about this. I was uncomfortable with a lot of things, and I read about veggie cars. Who knows about veggie cars? Some people? OK. I drive a veggie car. I drive a 2001 Golf uh, diesel that I converted myself. The diesel was invented in 1900. This is not new technology to run on peanut oil, OK? So I have a car, and you'll excuse this, but this is my little drawing, and I can't draw very well. So just 
Everybody deal with it, okay? Thank you. So that's, uh, that's my car. It looks a little better and it's got a much cooler stereo than this one does. Uh, that's a crop of corn. Those are my little birds that I like, and that's the sun. Um, I just put those in there because it needed something. It was just empty. Um, someone's taking a picture of it right now. <laughs> oh, it's cool. I'm very impressed. So anyway, my car's got vegetable oil in it. It's from, uh, what was it called? Uh, cookout? Cookout? They have french fries there? Okay. So they're like cooking your french fries, and it gets kind of nasty, and the guy goes, yeah, this is disgusting. Let's call Dave and give it to him because he's a nut job, and he'll take it away from us. So I take it, yeah, yeah, take it home. Get all the goop out of it, filter it, do a couple little magic voodoo things to it to get it all cleaned up, and I put it in my car, okay? Then I drive my car, and it puts a couple of things out into the environment, but almost nothing compared to regular gasoline or diesel. And one of the things it does put out is a lot of CO2. Well, that's bad, right? Yes? Actually, it's not true. CO2 you need to survive, but too much of it is bad. It was a trick question, but I'll forgive you. I set you up. So it puts CO2 out here. Well, the CO2 hangs up here for Al Gore to make movies about it and everybody to get upset about it, even though they know that I don't have to talk about it because if you're religious, I can, you know where I'm going with it. Okay. Not anything against Al Gore. I love Al Gore. I don't know Al Gore, but I love what he's doing and what he's done, and I'm just saying. It's, it, was, it was a little bit of a tough movie, I thought. It's just my thing. So anyway, the CO2 gets out there and it hangs up there for people to get all upset about it, all right? Then Farmer John plants a new crop of corn, and guess what it needs? You guys are going to be the leaders of the future. I love it. So CO2, it sequesters the CO2, pulls it in, traps it. I got you now. Grows that fabulous corn. They turn it into corn oil. It goes into the fryer at the cookout. The guy uses it. He calls me up. I take it away. And it goes into my car. It's a closed loop system. CO2 out, CO2 in. CO2 out, CO2 in. By the way, petroleum is a closed loop system as well, except it takes 150 million years and you need dinosaurs. So not so much with the petroleum closed. No. Okay, so this is just one idea that I decided I want out. I don't want to be a part of this anymore. This is what I'm going to do. Now, not everybody can do this, and we can't grow enough corn oil and there aren't enough diesel oils, and it's, there are all sorts of problems with this. But this just goes to show you that there are ways to step out of the problem. By the way, another really good way to step out of the problem that I know you all have, feet, bicycles. Buses. There are all sorts of ways to step out of the car problem. But the bottom line is, and guys, maybe I'm being sexist, but cars are cool, right? We like cars. And girls too. I mean, I know everybody likes cars. But I'm just saying, you know, guys, it's sort of like the old school guy likes a car thing. Ah, anyway, maybe I stepped in it there. Anyway, so this is a Tesla. Anybody seen these? These are all over California. Okay. This is, a, this is pretty much the first all-electric production car to come out. I've been in this car. It does zero to, zero to 60 in four seconds. It's an all-electric car. I was actually in the engine bay, and they told me to close my eyes. And I said, all right, what's up? And I closed my eyes and kunk, put this thing that kind of felt like the size of a turkey and weight of a turkey. And I went, what am I holding? And he goes, that's the engine. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. So basically, this is an insanely fast, insanely cool car that unfortunately cost $100,000. Now, how many people we have in the room? If you could all kitty up, I'd like one of these cars. We're not getting these cars. Come on. This isn't for us. But they are coming out with the sedan, which gets 200-mile range and charges up in a couple hours. That'll be $50,000. Okay, now we're getting down into once you know, we have good jobs and blah, 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 we can possibly get this. Okay, this is the Nissan Leaf, which will be available in a couple of months, and I'm actually very quickly on the waiting list for one, hopefully. Uh, and uh, it gets uh, 120 miles, and it charges 80% in 20 minutes, and it costs $25,000. Well, we're down to sort of normal car prices, right? And you don't have to support foreign governments to use this. You don't have to pollute to use it if you've got solar panels on your house. You don't have to do all sorts of things, and it's extremely fun to drive. This is the Coda, which is a, uh, it's a privately made car, which is essentially, eh, I think it's a little dorkier, but that's just me. Um, and this does about 200 miles and charges up in four hours. And this is going to be about 20,000. And this one is the one that I really want. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Aptera, which they're saying, but they're having a little trouble because it's a private company. is probably going to be in the $20,000 range. There's a gas engine that gets 300 miles to the gallon. And there's an electric... There's an electric engine that gets 120 miles uh, to the charge, okay? So these are potentially, if you're going to be buying a new car anyway, affordable alternatives that are here and or coming. This is not the future. This is essentially now. By the time you guys get to a point where you, some of you may need to buy a car, you're going to have these options. Um, by the way, one of the reasons, and again, people go like, ooh, new like, scientific technology from space and whatever. It's, no, it's not. 
See right here what's missing right there that most cars have? Mirror. Why? Because that cuts down on drag. The wind hits that and it slows the car down. It needs more energy. They just took them out and they put in video cameras and you got a little video monitor on the inside. The drag coefficient on this cool little car, which looks like a teardrop, drag coefficient means the way it slices through the air, okay, is less than the drag coefficient on the windshield wipers on your car. So this is not crazy, futuristic, fell from the sky Superman technology. This is smart, okay? And that's what we all have to start doing. Now, I sort of felt, with things being the way they are, that I had at some point to talk about the big white elephant in the room. <laughs> I don't want to make this talk about BP, which ironically enough, their slogan is Beyond Petroleum, which I find sort of sadly funny. Um, <laughs> nobody's mentioning that right now. But I think we need to just discuss that a little bit because it's sort of like, I know it's going to come up in questions, and let's face it. I'm assuming you all know what I'm talking about, right? It's not the fact that they've reneged on their free glasses with a Philip offer. It's the fact that they're dumping trillions of tons of oil into the ocean. Okay? We're on day 65 today. Anybody realize that? I didn't. When I looked it up, I was like, I know it's been a while, but it's sort of become normal, hasn't it? It's very, very sad. Oh, I put a long fade in here. I was supposed to hit that earlier. Well, anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, BP document, worst case scenario, 4.2 million gallons daily in the Gulf. It's probably not 4.2 million gallons daily, though. I think it's more like four, <laughs> so it's probably okay, right? 4.2 million gallons of oil. Now, it's going to affect you. It's going to come up here. You're going to go to the beach at some point, and you're going to see oil. I'm in California. It's not going to affect me the way it's going to affect you. You should be pissed, and you have every right to be pissed, and every one of us has every right to be pissed. I don't know about you, but I read the number 4.2 million gallons, and I, I, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what 4.2 million gallons is. Like, what does it look like? And I mean, I mean I've seen pictures. I, I just, I can't. 4.2 4, 4, 4 million gallons a day. Like, I don't get that. So I kind of try to, like, crunch things down to things I can understand, okay? In the hour or so I've been talking, 175,000 gallons of oil will go into the Gulf. In the hour that I'm talking, 175,000 gallons. Still. I don't understand 175,000 gallons. I don't get what that is. Essentially, that's 12 swimming pools worth of oil in this hour. OK? Or it's 4,772 trips across the United States in my AMC Gremlin, which I don't have, but I wish I did. By the way, and back, 4,772. That's every hour. I don't think any of us understand how massive this is. To give you another idea, I found a site and I copied this for you. This is what the oil spill would look like if it was over your state. It's close to the size of your state. OK? By the way, there will be guns and Molotov cocktails out in the lobby afterwards. We're all going to. I'm not trying to get. You should be angry, and you should do something about this, and we're going to get to that towards the end. You should write to people, and you should talk to people, and you should demand that something be done. But there are a couple of things. Now I think we have conceptually on some level an idea of how big this is, although truthfully after that, I still don't get it. I, it's, I, just, it's, I don't know. what. It's just too big. Eventually, it will be bigger than your state. And by the way, just so you know, there is the possibility that they may not be able to cap this thing. Nobody's talking about that, but there is that possibility. But the question is, and I hope you don't mind me just veering into politics briefly, why hasn't something been done about this? Now, granted, there's the technology. And by the way, as the future leaders of the state, I guarantee you that one of you brainiacs in the room who knows science can figure this out better than these idiots can, <laughs> OK? Because if you put your mind to it, you absolutely can do it. A 14-year-old guy invented television in the 1920s, for God's sake. So there's no reason you guys can't figure this out. But why hasn't the government done something about this? Someone said, BP what? Yes, thank you. So here's the deal. 
we've got elected officials, and they need to get elected, and they need to run massive campaigns, and they need money from somewhere. And where did they get them? They get them from coal companies, and they get them from oil companies, and they get them from all over, from places that we don't like, okay, because they do stuff like this. So you think those, those politicians, without us standing up and saying, you have to do something, do you seriously think they're going to say, hey, you got to do something about this? Or do you really think they're going to go in there with guns blazing and make these people stop? No, because they're going to jeopardize their future money. So just very quickly, something that you should put in your minds for future reference and start talking about and reading about, and someday when you get into office, because I guarantee you one of you will, please God make it a reality, is the idea that you cannot, as a politician, take money from a company, period. It can't be done because then you are beholden to them and they run our country. That's my quick little pol political sidestep there, okay? <laughs> Going back to BP sucks, and I think they do, but I also think Exxon sucks and Chevron sucks. You guys know about the Exxon Valdez? Yeah. 20 years ago, it was a horrific thing. You know how many oil gallons of oil came out of that? I think it was like 100,000 gallons. <laughs> it's nothing. 100,000 gallons, like I bathe in that now. This, I mean, it may, that was back then. It's getting harder and harder to get the oil, so they're going deeper and deeper, and the odds are becoming longer and longer that bigger things like this are going to happen. As long as we stay on this path, this stuff's going to happen. So the question is, is BP responsible? Yes. Is Deepwater responsible? Yes. Is Halliburton responsible, essentially, for everything bad in the world, but that's another issue. <laughs> but who is ultimately responsible for this? We are. You don't have heroin dealers where there are no heroin addicts. We are all addicts. And the only way that we can stop this, the only way that we can change it, the only way that you people in this room can change my children's future is if you stand up and start to scream. And it's time. You need to do it. You need to step up and you need to ask hard questions and you need to stop people from getting away with this stuff. I'm going to step away from BP for a minute because I'm going to go crazy if I keep going on like this. <laughs> 25 terawatts, we were talking about that. Now we're going to get to the good stuff, okay? First of all, we're going to need to move to renewable energy and efficiency. Do you know that the government has done a study that if all of us, everywhere in the United States, were to use every single off-the-shelf product that saved energy, we could save 80% of our energy in our houses? Everyone's all like, well, we're waiting for the technology. It's sitting in Walmart, for God's sakes. It's there. We just need to use it. We also need a societal shift in thinking. We've got to realize that we can't drive down the street every time we want. We've got to realize that we can't leave the lights on all the time. We've got to realize that we can't have it 69 degrees every single moment of life, okay? We have to be more cognizant of what we're doing. So first, renewable energy, okay? Renewable, a source of energy, energy can be replenished within 50 years. That's essentially what they mean by renewable energy, okay? Also, that it's sustainable. It means it won't be destroyed, okay? I have solar panels, it's not destroying the sun. If I take a windmill, it's not destroying the wind. If I turn it upside down, essentially, and put it into a river, if I do it correctly, it's not going to destroy that river, okay? So these are the two things that are important to think about. Just to give you a little primer, I'm sure you all know this, solar, we know about solar. I've got panels on top of my house, I don't pay anything for electricity, and it makes me really happy. <laughs> wind, do you have wind here in, in Northern California? North, North, North Carolina? I have it in North Carolina. Okay, you need wind, okay? You all understand this, it turn, the wind turns the, the, turns the fan, whatever you want to call it, and uh, it generates electricity, very clean, very renewable, very sustainable. Turn it upside down, put it in a river, you've got a hydroelectric. You've got to be careful about the fish, but that's other people's jobs and just make sure they do it. Okay? Uh, biofuels, we talked, about, uh, we talked about vegetable oil, right? Okay? Geothermal, this is very cool. I'm actually moving to Connecticut soon. And the house that I get, I'm going to outfit with geothermal. And once it is done, it will be 70 degrees all year round, and I will never pay for uh, heating or cooling. Okay? Why? Because there is a law, and I don't remember what the law is called, but maybe someone in science can tell me, where if you have a certain uh, liquid in a specific volume and you put it under pressure, the temperature will rise. It's Boyle's law, maybe? I don't know. Anyway, let's just say it's Boyle's law. How about that? But anyway, so what they do is they've got these things that go down in the ground where the temperature is 56 degrees once you get to six feet down. It comes into your house, and depending on what you need, you either put it, pressurize it, and heat it up, and then it heats your house, 
or you use it the other way, sort of like a refrigerator, and it cools your house. And it basically, there's no downside to it. And once you've put it in, you're done. Most of you are probably going, yeah, but it costs like 500,000. Nah, I think it's probably gonna be about $22,000, which when you're looking at the complete price of a house, the payback is very, very quick. I don't understand why it's not illegal for any house in America to be built without this. It's beyond me, but biodigesters. They use this in the third world. I'd love to see them start using this in North Carolina pretty soon, okay? It's a big bag they put in the ground. They've got a pipe going in here. It's half filled with water. A pipe goes into the house. They drop poop in there, animal poop, human poop, and it decomposes and methane rises up. And just like natural gas, it comes into your house. It's completely renewable because everybody poops and it's completely sustainable for essentially the same reason. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Show of hands, how many people are doing this tomorrow? No takers, really? Come on, all right, I'm calling you, I'm calling you. Very good, but again, I know it's kind of funny, but in places where they have no infrastructure, it's a perfect way to heat your house and cook. And it takes nothing, and it's using something you're making anyway, so go for it, right? On the count of three, everybody say, hey Dave, what's in your bag? One, two, three. It's, it's, it's unbelievable, because every time I ask, people want to know, and it's just, I have blessed my way. So, when I was doing my little trash experiment, I started carrying some things in my bag because I just thought, you know, I need to waste a little less and I'm keeping everything in the basement and we'll see what goes. So I'm gonna get to this one last. Coffee mug, I drink a lot of coffee, okay? This cost me about 10 bucks like five years ago. I get 10 cents back at Starbucks and Pete's and all these places. So this essentially was free, it paid for itself. I can stir it without a stirrer. It doesn't spill on me, so I look like an idiot when I show up in a meeting. And essentially, it pays for itself and it's free. I'm not part of the 1.5 billion, that's with a B, coffee cups that Starbucks sends to the landfill every year. Make sense? You shouldn't drink coffee, you're too young. I just have to say that. Okay, <laughs> next up. Who's using plastic bags out there? Anyone? No one's using plastic bags? Okay, you don't want to use plastic bags. Why? What are plastic bags made of, if I can find them? They're made of petroleum. And you know what? Do they recycle plastic bags here? Oh, all right. I may get to my plastic bag in a minute because I don't know what I did with it. Oh, here we go. Um, plastic bags. If they recycle them, they get caught in the machines and they don't get recycled. Also, one million plastic bags in the United States enter the landfill every single minute. One million. Destroys wildlife, it destroys ecosystems, it destroys everything. So I have this, this is actually called a Chico bag. I carry it in my backpack and I'm done, right? I never have to use one again. I get five cents back at most stores every time I use it, it's free. Does this make sense or does this plastic bag make sense? How do you train yourself to do this? You mentally say, you know what? Because I care, I'm never gonna take a plastic bag again. And you only have to walk out of the store like twice like this, dropping stuff like an idiot because you forgot your bag and then you remember your bag. Not that I would do that, of course, other people do that. You know what my favorite thing is? You ever go and buy a, a greeting card? Those little greeting cards? They give you that stupid little plastic bag <laughs> that you can't use for anything else and you take it home and you throw it out or you recycle it. What is that for? Put it in your backpack, okay? Doesn't that make sense? Anyone? Really? Yeah, okay, just making sure you're with me. Now, I work in the film industry. In the film industry, they have something called the craft service table. There's food all the time because if we don't eat constantly, we get very, very upset. So one of the things they always have is cereal, and I like cereal even though it's terrible for you and whatever. So I decided I gotta get around this somehow, okay? So I carry this, this is an old toothbrush container. It's a knife fork, uh, actually a fork, a spoon, and sometimes a knife in here. And I never have to use a plastic knife or fork or spoon. Why? Well, why would you use something for five minutes that's gonna stay on the planet for 5,000 years and destroy the groundwater? Does that make sense? What's a plastic knife, fork, and spoon made out of? I just cut out my dependence on petroleum a little more. Now, if I'm eating cereal, I need something to eat it out of. I tried my hand, but that didn't work very well. So I actually found this, which hopefully, uh, who's, who's got that? This is an Oricasso bowl. Huh, 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 that's pretty cool, right? All right, so first of all, you don't have to use one of those other bowls that you're gonna throw out, but secondly, you got this, and you're, you know, you're pretty cool, and chicks dig it, and guys like it, and whatever, and you know, you sort of like, you put it together, and people are like, you can also spread the message, because you're like, what's that? And you're like, oh, oh this, uh, it's just a bowl, bring with me, and, you know, put up, put up. And then, you can take your water bottle, and you pour a little water on here, and you have your uh, handy dandy towel, which I didn't bring with me, because I was on the plane, and it was wet, and you wipe it off, and you put it back in here, and you are done. 
Doesn't that make more sense than using a bowl every day or every other day? How many of you go to school and eat cereal at school in the morning? You? <laughs> okay. Just <laughs> learned a little bit of something about North Carolina. Okay, well, that's not an issue, but if you eat like sloppy joes for breakfast in the morning or whatever you eat here, think about bringing a bowl and a spoon. It's not a big deal, okay? Now, finally, there's this, okay? How many of you have one of these? How cool is that? Give yourselves a round of applause, come on. <laughs> Plastic water bottles are probably the dumbest thing to come into society since something dumber. I don't know what it was, but okay, why? Well, number one, you know nobody regulates water that's sold over interstate lines? There's no governmental organization that's saying whether water is pure. Dasani, tap water. They used to say bottled at the source until they found out the source was Uncle Al's garage and then they decided to say tap water, okay? Nobody knows what you're drinking. Secondly, the plastic can put all sorts of stuff like BPAs into it that can cause hormonal disruption, which I don't even know what that is, but I don't want hormonal disruption, do you? Okay? Let's just say, for sake of math, because it's easy, a plastic bottle of water costs, uh, costs you a uh, dollar, right? Okay? Let's say I drink a, one a day, that's seven bucks a week, right? Yeah, that's $7, okay? This cost me, I think, 10 or 12. So this has paid for itself in two weeks. Over a year, I've saved close to $1,000. No, I've saved $300. Over, a month, over two years, I've saved, who knows? Just keep going with that. You save tons of money, I'll have this forever. By the way, there are a lot of other things people don't tell you about this, and I don't know if you know this, okay? If you are ever spelunking and you get caught in a cave, you can stick this up and pull yourself right through. No? Do you know what spelunking is? It's weird, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Anybody here a drummer in a band? Okay, if you are in the concert and you need a little more cowbell, right there, baby. There are so many things that you can do with this, okay? So it's not just about water, it's a style accessory, okay? It's part of your future U2 concert, whatever, I don't know, whatever it is. But it just makes sense. I mean, I could keep on going on. By the way, hey, shocking here, what are those plastic water bottles made out of? It's just stupid. And by the way, it's coming out of the faucet. Now, what, do you guys like soda? Yeah. Okay. I don't know about you, but I'm a Mr. Pibb guy. Anybody like Mr. Pibb? Yeah. I used to like Dr. Pepper, but he's a little too hoity-toity for me. Now I'm into Mr. Pibb. If there was Mr. Pibb coming out of my faucet, and someone said, you know what, I know it's coming out of the faucet, but maybe you could just buy it for a dollar at the store. <laughs> do you seriously think I'd be... No, I'd have my mouth over the faucet 24-7 during Mr. Pitt. I wouldn't go and buy it at the store. Why should water be any different? Okay? And by the way, the government regulates that. You can look online. There are checks all day. And if you have bad piping in your house, which does happen, you can get filters. So it's really a no-brainer. There's nothing about plastic water bottles in an area where you have drinkable water that makes sense. Done. Another thing about plastic water bottles, and this is something that I carry with me, is this. This is a sample from the North Pacific Gyre. Anybody ever heard of the gyre? Yeah. Okay. Tell me what the gyre is. It's a huge, just like trash plump in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, it's a huge trash island in the middle of the ocean. Now, there's a lot of misnomers. This is actually an old picture. It's now one big thing, and it's twice the size of the continental United States. Several friends of mine, and I'll give you the, the address afterwards, uh, are not only studying this gyre, but five other gyres, okay? It's floating with plastic. Now, if you, if you went over a, with a plane, you wouldn't see plastic, 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 plastic. It doesn't work that way. But if you get down in the water, what you have is little tiny confetti, okay? And bigger pieces like this, which, by the way, you're welcome to come see afterwards. You'll see on a video in a second. My friend Marcus, who traveled across it on a boat that he made out of plastic bottles, not the guy who's doing it now, by the way, someone who did it a year ago. Um, uh, this is, by the way, the bottle, I'm sorry. That's 1,500 miles out in the middle of the ocean. That's where plastic water bottle caps should be, right? Makes sense. I don't know how this stuff got there, but it got there. This is just them scooping up, and it goes almost 30 meters deep, okay? This is the last one that's going to bother you, and then we're going to bring it up, okay? This is Marcus. He's holding up this uh, line with things on it. All sorts of things they found. There's a G.I. Joe leg. There's a Bic lighter. G.I. Joe, like 1,500 miles, those things keep on going, right? And uh, toothbrush, and there's a Bic lighter, there's like the top to one of those things. I said, what's up, Marcus? You know, you just found this stuff. And he goes, well, no, and I'm sorry about this next picture, but I think it's important. We found it in the carcass of a bird. Because when you look in here, if you take a look, there's very little plastic. 
The birds scoop down and they eat the colored stuff because they think it's fish, and then they die. And they're all over the islands. And he said they found thousands of these. Now, maybe you're a pelican hater. Some people are. I don't judge. Not openly. And maybe this isn't a big deal for you, but remember I mentioned the confetti? Well, as we're driving our super cool cars and it's putting out all that unburnt fuel, which it does, most of that falls on the ocean, and that contains cancer-causing PCBs. And those get sucked up because of some chemical reaction that I don't understand to that confetti. And then the fish eat it. And because plastic never breaks down, ever, it gets smaller, but it never breaks down completely, that gets into the fish, the PCBs. And then fish eat the fish, and then fish eat the fish, and then who's eating it in their fish filet at McDonald's? So it's coming back to haunt us, OK? I'm sorry about that, but the more you know, right? This is their, their raft that they made out of 15,000 uh, uh, plastic bottles. It's called Junk Raft, if you want to check it out. Junkraft.com or five gyres. This is, the, this is them studying the other gyres. They're kind of funky, and they, they have great videos, which is great. But you'll learn a lot. And when you talk to people about this, they'll be, oh, wow, this is like I had no idea. And it really brings it home. What else can you do? Turn off your lights. Who does this every time they leave a room? Cool, right on. Some friends of mine did a study, and for two months, they turned off light every time they left the room religiously. Checked their electrical use, checked it against a year before, they saved 20% in their electricity, okay? Depending on you, where you are, that's coal, that's all sorts of energy. That just makes sense. It saves you money, it saves you time. Compact fluorescence, we know about these. I'll be, per I'll be perfectly honest, I don't love these, <laughs> okay? Who doesn't like them? They're not the greatest. LED technology is right on the way, but the bottom line is we have to use what we've got right now, and there's going to be a next step. This is just an interim. But if you're not using these things, you're not being smart about the problem. Buy green power. Did you know that you can actually go probably to your, your power company here and pay them like five, six dollars more a month, and they will offset what you're using by buying green power where it's available? So essentially, you're allowing someone else to live cleanly in place of you, and you're essentially taking your, your pollution that you're putting out of the environment. It's a way to offset it. It's like five, six bucks. If everybody did this, it would bring renewable energy down to a level where it would be cheaper than coal energy, and we'd be done with the problem. Kill your vampires. You know your iPhone and your, your stereo and your TV and your microwave, everything that's plugged in that has a switch is using power 24-7? You know that little blinky light on the uh, microwave, the clock? Yeah. yeah? Okay. On the average person, if you're like me and you just use the microwave to heat up water, uh, the clock will use more power over its life than you will ever use cooking food. Does that make sense? It does? <laughs> Doesn't make sense. No. I've got a clock in the kitchen. I don't want to use that. So turn it off. You put it on a little switch, click it off, and be done with it. Okay? Or unplug them, by the way. Drive less. Or better yet, don't drive at all. One day a week, decide that you're not going to drive, OK? It's not the end of the world. Or make a radius around your house, OK, half mile radius, and just decide that you're never going to drive within that radius unless you're going somewhere or you're coming back from somewhere. It won't stop you from driving there. It'll just make you think about, I'm going to put this into another trip. You stop most of that, you've done an incredible thing. You've decreased our reliance on oil, and you can send a nice little letter to BP. <laughs> Grow some food. There's so many reasons to do this, but the big thing is most of our food comes from thousands of miles away. And once you've had an organic tomato or apple or whatever, you'll never want to eat one that isn't. It's unbelievable. Stop eating meat or start by cutting out one day a week. One of the single... Yeah, baby. Vegetarians! One of the single greatest things you can use. You know the average cow takes 250 barrels of oil and moving it, and taking it, and cutting the lawn, and, and doing all sorts of things to it, whatever they do to cows, I don't know. 250 barrels of oil, OK? You know how many cows that's dropping into the Gulf right now? It'd be ugly, but you know, you know what I'm saying? Stop eating meat, OK? Reduce, reuse, recycle, right? We know this. Change it to refuse, reuse, recycle. Don't buy it in the first place, right? Do you need it? Do you want it? Right? Makes sense. Get informed. You've got to think about things. You've got to just like, do more, look at in more information. Don't sit idly by. Don't be apathetic, OK? That's what's killing us right now. And it's literally killing us. Yay, he's finishing up, right? Oh, come on. That's where you're supposed to go. Boo! Even if it's not heartfelt, I'll take it. Anybody know who this is? Who said Rockefeller? God, there's always one really smart kid in the room. <laughs> right on. John D. Rockefeller, OK? 
He actually, ironically enough, started Standard Oil, the richest man in the history of richness. He's, by, by today's standards, he's bigger than Bill Gates and the Sultan of Brunei and anyone. Standard Oil, okay? But only one person in this room knew who he was, right? Who is this? Anybody not know who he was? Someone with no money, who because he had an idea and he stuck to it, brought down an entire empire. Which would you rather be? Me too. But here's the ironic thing. You fix these problems and you can have more money than Rockefeller and you can be better known than Gandhi. This is your moment. This is the moment where you can shine because there's so many problems out there. You can't swing a stick without hitting 100 of them, but they all have solutions. Remember that 25 terawatts? Every day the US burns 400 million gallons of gasoline. And a lot more is dumped into the Gulf. <laughs> That's kind of sick. I shouldn't be making jokes about it, but it's just too crazy. Every day the US burns 6 billion pounds of coal. Leaving your lights on. Vampire power. Every day the US receives more energy from the sun than its residents use in an entire year. Which of those three scenarios makes sense? See this? What is this? Let's say you covered the entire planet. I know you can't, but just work with me here with solar panels, right? Two hours of one day of one year to generate all of the power that we need. Cut it in half and you got four hours. Cut it in a quarter, you got eight hours. You know where I'm going with this. This is something that's doable. And if we don't do it, we've only got ourselves to blame. Wind, right? There are essentially 100,000 windmills in the world. They've said that if there were a million, we could generate a quarter of the world's power cleanly, renewably, sustainably, and cheaply. Okay? 900,000 windmills. You know how many cars were made last year? 90 million. 900,000 windmills, 90 million cars. You know that during World War II, there was not a single American car built for two years. Why? Because the government stepped in and said, you're no longer going to build cars, you're going to build tanks and bombs and planes. And we're going to pay you the same amount, so everybody still has a job, it's all going to be good, and when it's over, you'll go back to what you're doing. Why can't they step in and do the same right now? It's a good question to write to your congressman. This is my friend Paul Scott, and that's his wife, Zan. This is, they live in Santa Monica. This is Paul. Twice a year for 10 minutes, he's got to clean off the solar panels, and you don't want to be around him because it's just painstaking. He gets very grumpy. <laughs> It doesn't look that grumpy there, but it's not good. You got to, twice a year, he's got to clean them up. This is their RAV4 uh, EV, and uh, they drive around it, and they're kind of goofy and whatever. And this is their motorcycle, which is also electric, which they're really goofy on. Um, and this is the amount of money that Paul and Zan spent to run their household on electricity and power both of their modes of transportation last year. Shut up. <laughs> Who said shut up? Stand up, my friend. Stand up. Thank you. Shut up. Right on. Shut up. Exactly. Can you tell me that any one of your parents would not be cool with this? Who would not want this? And yes, but solar panels cost a lot of money and electric cars cost a lot of money. Well, what if the only car you could buy was an electric car? And what if every house that was built had solar panels? And what if coal was no longer a choice, which eventually it will not be? There are so many opportunities out there, it's unbelievable. I'm going to finish up now, and then I have no idea what time it is, but then I'm going to, uh, I'll leave you with some things on here, and you guys can ask some questions. But I want to leave you with this. How old are you? 16, 17. There's something that you need to know, and it's this. I really want you to listen to this because I wish someone had told me this when I was 16 and 17. I don't know what you're going to do with the rest of your life. And some of you are going to become very powerful people. But right now, at the point that you are in your life, you are more powerful than you can possibly conceptualize. You are more powerful than you can possibly understand. And that is simply because you have not entered into the part of your life where you have mortgages, and bills, and house payments, and everybody's expecting you to keep up with the Joneses. You have the ability to think clearly and to think 
concretely about the problems that are ahead of us. And while what I've shown you today seems like it's a big burden, you can look at it as the hugest burden in the world or you can look at it as your finest moment because your generation can be the generation that stands up and says enough. And the way that you need to do that is by becoming involved. You need to confront your parents respectfully and your elected officials respectfully and ask them hard questions and not walk away when they give you BS answers. You have the ability to look these people in the eye. If I ask them, they can send me packing with some sort of, oh, whatever. If you go up to them and go, look, me and all of my friends in my environmental clubs and all the kids at the GS and all the kids in my school and eventually all the kids in my college, we're all together on this. And if you want to be voted back in, you better get cracking. You have the ability to do that. And they can't say no to you. So I want you to think about that. And I really would, I would push you to start getting involved in the process and changing things because this, I truly believe that the people that I'm looking in this room are part of the finest generation that this country will ever see. And we will only know that at the end of the day. But if I were you, I would want to be part of that. So you have the opportunity to stand up and do something. The only question is, do you want to do it? It's not going to be easy, but at the end of the day, you'll be able to say, I did that. I got this country off of oil. I got this country off of coal. Of coal. I used my brain, and I did it. Absolutely amazing, and he deserves to be able to spread this presentation like all, all over. And it was just absolutely, it was just amazing, and it inspired me to like actually do stuff instead of sitting around and like curling up and being absolutely depressed about the whole situation. So he was fantastic. I just being completely honest, I totally thought that environmentalists were like nut jobs before this, and I thought that they were just like crazy people who just thought, oh, the earth is dying and we should do something about it. And I never paid much attention to them. Everything that he said was so logical. Like everything that we're doing is killing not even our planet, but ourselves. And so it just made a lot of sense. And I really think that it would stick with other people my age and younger and older the way that it did me because it really clicked. And I totally don't think they're not jobs anymore. And I kind of want to be one. So. <laughs> Thanks, he was great. I thought it was amazing. There was a lot of stuff that I had no idea, um, and it was really, really educational and really inspiring. I came into Dave's seminar pretty skeptical. I'm not really considered, never considered myself a person that aligns myself with this, like, environmentalism or anything like that particularly, but coming out of there, like, I would almost consider that life-changing because Dave didn't talk about a political, political agenda or anything. He didn't even talk about, about what's right and what's wrong and who considers what's right and what's wrong. He just talked about the facts and about how you can be a part of a solution. And so I think that his talk is fantastic and if every person, every high school student in the country heard what he said, that the world would be changed. And so I think Dave did an awesome job. This has been a life-changing experience. Um, Dave has showed me a lot that I didn't know. I thought I knew and just completely turn my perspective around. Thank you. And that everything is in our generation's hands and that we actually have the power to do something. And so it really makes me want to take action and help solve the problem and find new solutions. Because now I feel like I can. I feel like my generation can do that. And it was awesome. And I'm just <laughs> so grateful to have listened to this. And I believe that every child in America deserves to listen nice. to this so they can start making awesome. changes. Wow just came out of uh, Dave's environmental seminar and that was literally the most inspiring thing I've ever heard. He preaches to common sense and not to any political side. He makes it so that it seems completely logical and not just seems that it is completely logical to do the things that he talks about. As well, his speech is not boring. He actually keeps everybody entertained and I was in there for two and a half hours and never had a dull moment. It was just simply life-changing. 